Welcome to this episode of the Common Sense Skeptic. We're taking on another Mars topic today, this time revolving around a process that would be critically important in the SpaceX paradigm of Mars colonization, which is the ability to refill the two propellant tanks of Starship for a return trip back to Earth. Without the ability to refuel a craft on Mars, there would be absolutely no way for the ship to leave the planet's surface, so anybody going to Mars without having such a process in place is certainly going to die on the planet if they don't die en route or while propulsively landing upright in regolith with the consistency of talcum powder. So there would be no free return trip to Earth as Musk has promised, and no reusing the craft for round trips between planets, which means Musk would need to continually churn out endless numbers of starships on Earth for this purpose. 10,000 of them just to carry his 1 million people to Mars by 2050, plus cargo craft, plus tankers, plus all the other things we've covered in other episodes. For this episode, we're going to take a look at the equipment that would be required for the process of creating fuel, also known as propellant and oxidizer, for Starship on Mars. Work out some back of the envelope calculations as to what level of production is required over what time frame, and see if we can shed some light on the energy such an undertaking would require. In short, we're going to rough out the logistics of this, because it's pretty obvious nobody at SpaceX has done this properly yet. Apparently nobody in this picture is capable of doing the math. If they had run the numbers, they'd know what we're about to show you, that the concept of ISRU on Mars to create propellant for refilling stations for a fleet of starships using processes stated by Musk in the past is laughably scientifically fictitious. Also, if Musk had any clue at all about this, he would not be making ridiculous claims such as this one on Twitter, responding to Everyday Astronaut, stating that SpaceX might be starting to fuel Starship test articles using ISRU and the Sabatier process at Boca Chica sometime in 2021, which obviously did not happen, despite clickbait reporters such as Isaiah Alonzo reporting on this like it was already a done deal. Let's see what might be holding up their progress, shall we? Since there are no tank farms or any other equipment on the surface of Mars, such as there is in Boca Chica, the ship would have to bring with it all the equipment astronauts require to create propellant and oxidizer from the raw materials taken from the surface of Mars or the Martian atmosphere. The term for this paradigm of using resources at the destination instead of bringing everything you need with you is called in-situ resource utilization, shortened to in-situ or ISRU. Starship engines, their current unreliable Raptor design at any rate, uses cryogenic methane and liquid oxygen as propellants, two materials that are fairly easy to come by on Earth, but Mars has neither. Instead, the red planet has atmospheric carbon dioxide and some surface water ice, which happen to be the two byproducts of burning methane and oxygen together. With enough energy and with the right processes in place, those waste compounds can be forced back into propellant and oxidizer. And of course, they're going to need a lot of both refined materials to get this massive craft to launch from the surface of Mars with no booster assembly. So let's break down some numbers. We'll start with the elemental and compound chemistry. Methane is also known chemically as CH4, with carbon atoms weighing 12 atomic units and hydrogen weighing a little over one, for every volume of CH4, carbon accounts for 75% of the mass of methane per volume. And of course, with liquid oxygen, that's just chilled O2, so that is 100% mass per volume of that element. Moving to the other side of the equation, with carbon dioxide, CO2, carbon weighing 12 atomic units and oxygen at 16, carbon accounts for only 27% of the mass per volume, roughly a 1 to 3 ratio. So when Musk says at his Carbon Copy Starship presentations they use 3.5 tons of oxygen per ton of methane, that's in the ballpark allowing for the errors acting against 100% combustion. Water is H2O, with oxygen weighing 16 atomic units and hydrogen weighing only 1. For every volume of H2O, oxygen accounts for 89% of the mass of water per volume, and hydrogen accounts for only 11%. In terms of energy, every kilogram of methane that is burned produces approximately 55 megajoules of energy, mainly in the form of heat. The electrical conversion of 55 megajoules comes in at 15.28 kilowatt hours, or the ability to burn 152 100 watt light bulbs, or run 13 1200 watt hair dryers non-stop for one hour. This is going to be the minimum energy requirement needed to insert back into the process to recreate one kilogram of fuel using the waste products of combustion. So where is that energy going to come from? Presumably, as illustrated in many different SpaceX frames and as stated by Musk on many occasions, they intend to use solar power on Mars. 
Let's say they're only producing these compounds during the sunlight hours on Mars. And let's also assume that they have landed relatively close to the equator to give them equal times of day versus night. On Mars, that's still roughly 12 hours apiece, difference of 37 minutes split two ways. We could go around the clock, but you would need twice as many solar panels as we're going to work out, and a battery farm to store the energy to be used at night. As for which panels to use, we have used Tesla solar panels as a reference before, so let's keep that going. Their online specs state that their Chinese-made panels generate 400 watts when positioned properly and are hit dead on with the sun. That's on Earth. On Mars, where solar irradiance is 59% that of Earth, that 400 watts becomes a 240 watt peak value per 21.3 square foot panel, which is about 2 square meters. Their arrays weigh about 47.4 pounds or 21.5 kilograms per panel. Any additional equipment such as wiring harnesses, inverters, motorized mounts, etc. would add even more mass to the overall array. So now, as we go through the power requirements for these various collection and processing stages, we'll be able to take note of how many solar panels that process is going to take. The other option for power generation is to use nuclear energy. NASA recently awarded three companies $5 million each to come up with a concept for nuclear reactors to be used on the moon and eventually on Mars. Lockheed Martin, Westinghouse, and IX were all given contracts to develop initial design concepts for a 40 kilowatt class fission power system that could endure the lunar environment for 10 years. So we will also be able to say how many nuclear reactors a particular process would require if they took that road instead. The next thing we have to look at is how long would Martian colonists have to prepare the fuel for the return journey home. For this, we can refer to a NASA mission architecture. NASA is currently under presidential order dating back to 2017 to get human feet on Mars by 2033. So they do have some possible mission architecture timelines worked up. The lowest energy transfer to Mars is the Hohmann transfer orbit. Such a round trip would entail 9 months travel time to Mars, 16 months on the surface, and another 9 months return trip. This would not include time spent in orbit around Earth to refill propellant as the Starship requires, a process that could take weeks or months to conduct. We don't know how long exactly because that in-orbit fuel transfer technology has not been tested because it does not exist. Alternatively, Russia created a joint plan for NASA and ESA consideration in 2002 with a total schedule of 440 days to complete the round trip, giving the astronauts about two months on the surface of Mars, with each interplanetary transit taking over six months. Can they make the trip quicker? Maybe, by using a lot more energy, but Holman transits are the most energy efficient way to make the trip. We're going to work our numbers with the crew on the surface for the 16 months, which is about 500 days, because even with the much longer surface time, these numbers don't look good. So that's the chemistry, the possible power sources, and the time frame on planet covered. Now let's take a look at the process Musk intends to use to create the methane. The Sabatier process, named for Nobel Prize in Chemistry winner Paul Sabatier, who discovered this reaction in 1897, uses carbon dioxide and hydrogen gases to create methane and water. But it is not as simple as it sounds. And for the number of times Musk has mentioned it, he continuously gets the formula wrong. He says this during every interview. Mars has a CO2 atmosphere and has water ice, which is CO2 plus H2O, so you can make CH4, methane, and O2 oxygen right. on one, Mars. What, presumably one of the first tasks on Mars will be to create yes. a fuel plant that can create the fuel for the return yes. trips of many starships. Again, the Sabatier process uses carbon dioxide and hydrogen, not water. And it's not just a matter of blending the elements. While in combination, those raw materials need to be heated and pressurized. The process requires operating temperatures of approximately 400 degrees Celsius and a vessel capable of holding pressure of 3 megapascals or 30 bar versus normal atmospheric pressure on Earth of 101.3 kilopascals or 1 bar. Both of these conditions requiring a great deal of energy to initiate the reaction. The reaction is also not as straightforward as this diagram shows from SpaceX. The reaction looks more like this, with many intermediary stages requiring a nickel catalyst to facilitate the reaction. That's the introduction to the process and energy that's required to produce the propellants if there were pipelines delivering pure carbon dioxide and hydrogen directly from vendors to the processing site, which of course there won't be. So the astronauts land on Mars, install a field of solar panels or a grid of nuclear reactors, 
and set up all the gear they're going to need to generate methane before going to sleep on the same day. Because in the morning, they're going to start collecting water ice, sucking carbon dioxide out of the air, and then firing up the Sabachi reactors to start filling their tanks. We need to know how much of each cryogenic propellant is required in total, and then break that number down to a daily quota for each of the 500 days. A Starship has a total propellant load of 1,200 tons. By all accounts, there is 3.5 times as much liquid oxygen by weight as there is methane, despite their apparent vessel sizes on Starship. That ratio gives us 267 tons of pure methane, spread across 500 days, for a 534 kilogram daily quota, and 933 tons of pure oxygen spread across 500 days for an 1866 kilogram daily quota. But in terms of collecting the raw materials, what would it take? Let's begin with the extraction of carbon dioxide from the Martian atmosphere. In case it needs to be stated, the Martian atmosphere is very different from that on Earth. In terms of makeup, Earth's atmosphere is around 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. A very small portion of the atmosphere, around 1%, is made up of trace gases such as carbon dioxide, which accounts for only 412.5 parts per million, or about 0.04125%. On Mars, carbon dioxide and nitrogen swap positions, carbon dioxide accounting for the majority of the Martian atmosphere at 96%, with nitrogen at 1.9%, and oxygen reduced to being a trace gas. Based on these numbers, it would seem as if there's all kinds of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to use for any in-situ propellant creation process, right? No, not right. See, while the relative concentrations of gases appear to support that belief, the fact is that Mars's atmospheric density is only around 6 millibar where on Earth is 1,013 millibar, so Mars's atmosphere is 0.6% that of Earth. To illustrate how thin this is, let's compare atmospheric densities to the color white on a solid black background. If this white circle on the left represents Earth's atmosphere of 1,013 millibars as 100% strength, this second fading circle on the right represents Mars's atmosphere at less than 1%. You probably can't make out any presence at all depending on your screen, so let's add a border around that circle, representing how visible a 10% reading would have been. See, factually, Mars's atmosphere is only 6 millibars better than the total vacuum of outer space, despite how it is depicted in the movies. Many people have seen the movie The Martian, and we've referred to it before. Many moviegoers believe that that film was meticulously crafted with current scientific and technological awareness. Unfortunately, parts of it are not nearly as scientifically accurate as you would have hoped. For one, if you planted anything in the dirt with a lump of human poop beside it, all that's going to happen is your seed stock is going to rot thanks to the bacteria and pathogens it contains. Human feces, like any other form of manure, needs to be composted first to kill off the bad bacteria and pathogens before it can be used as fertilizer, and that process requires microorganisms you may or may not have brought with you to Mars including worms, bacteria, and fungi. And you can tell in the movie this process was given no consideration because once the composting is complete, Watney would not have needed those nose plugs. Composting toilets are available in the marketplace and they use heat, extraction fans, and biological starters to speed up the process. At the end of the processing cycle, the remaining material you remove from the composting tray can be handled without even using gloves. Not saying you should, only that you could if you wanted to. The next point they got wrong was the opening scene and setup, where a sudden vicious dust storm sweeps through the landing site with winds so strong they were shifting the Mars Ascent vehicle or MAV, threatening to topple it. While trying to reach the MAV by foot after leaving the habitat with his teammates, Watney gets smoked by a hatch cover that gets ripped free from what appears to be hurricane force winds, which throw Watney through the maelstrom like a rag doll into the darkness. The MAV reaches a critical lean, forcing the rest of the team to take off, abandoning Watney on the surface, leaving him to be dead, setting up the premise for the remainder of the movie. But in fact, the creative license they took in depicting that scenario is terribly scientifically inaccurate. Mars does get massive dust storms, and they are quite visible even from observatories on Earth because the incredibly fine particulate making up the regolith on Mars' surface is easily disturbed and takes a while to settle. But those storms are not capable of doing the type of damage depicted in the movie. Because the Martian atmosphere is so thin, a 160 km per hour wind on the surface of Mars would only have the same force blowing against you as a 1 km per hour wind on Earth. To mimic the destructive force of 250 km per hour Category 5 hurricane winds on Mars, 
such as the landing parties seem to be encountering with everything blowing everywhere, including rocks, those winds would have to be blowing 40,000 kilometers per hour, or about 41 times the speed of sound on Mars, which is 900 kilometers per hour. Now, after the MAV leaves the planet's surface, and before Watney's punctured suit runs out of air, he comes to, under clear skies in sharp sunshine, and makes his way back to the battered surface habitat, the storm nowhere to be seen. Again, that would not be the case. Martian dust storms last for weeks, some for months. They encompass the entire planet on a regular basis. One such event in 2018 killed the Opportunity rover when the solar-dependent device was starved of the sun's energy for too long. That electrostatically charged dust hangs around for a very long time, which is something else any future Martian exploration will have to consider, especially if they're planning on using solar arrays to survive. The larger point to be made here, though, is that the Mars atmosphere is incredibly thin, despite how it is depicted in the movies. And let's be honest, movie depictions are often confused with reality by the general audience. So here's the reality of it. Let's say this gray cube represents one cubic meter of Earth's atmosphere. In that cubic meter, 78% of the contained gas mix is nitrogen, 21% of it is oxygen, and all the remaining gases make up about 1%. The 412.5 parts per million, or 0.04125% of carbon dioxide in our breathable air, can be represented by this tiny pink cube. And yes, that is to scale. Now this green cube represents the relative density of Mars's atmosphere compared to Earth, at 1 160th as dense. Cube root of 160 is about 5.5, and according to the ESA, 96% of the contents of that cube are carbon dioxide, represented by this pink cube, and the trace gases, such as nitrogen, argon, and oxygen, are represented in the very thin green outline that remains. So the relative concentration of carbon dioxide in the Martian atmosphere is about 15 times what it is on Earth, even after compression into a one-bar atmosphere. Capturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is not a new concept. There are some companies on Earth already attempting this, although their claims tend to be a little questionable. New Life, for example, hit the news years ago with their claim that they were pulling plastic out of the air to make plastic bags for Dell computers. Quite a few news organizations fell for those claims. Although New Light is still around, their association with Dell has not been mentioned since 2014. Thunderfoot did a piece about this company at the time. None of their claims made any sense then, and nothing has changed since. Another more recent company to hit the news regarding carbon capture was Carbon Engineering, with their claims that they can make gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel with their air-to-fuels process by pulling atmospheric carbon dioxide through their filters, then, as with the Sabache process, adding energy back into a synthesis process. This company is set up in Squamish, British Columbia, so although they mention solar energy, it is far more likely their renewable source of energy is hydro, as there are no solar panels in their promotional video, and British Columbia creates the vast majority of their energy through hydro projects. You get the idea. The green grift isn't new. Musk Carbon Capture XPRIZE stunt is pretty much doing the same thing. Green virtue signaling that ignores the longer tailpipe of what they're doing. In reality, the fact that Musk is sponsoring this competition is a pretty good indicator that he does not know how to collect the carbon dioxide that he's going to need on Mars. Failing to get around the energy equation is pretty much always going to put the brakes on these concepts. They're extremely energy intensive, and that energy has to come from somewhere. But let's say a collection system can be designed to function on Mars. How much carbon dioxide do we need to collect out of this? Well, they need 534 kilograms of methane daily, with carbon representing 75% of that molecular mass, so let's call it 400.5 kilograms of elemental carbon. They'd be getting that element from carbon dioxide, where carbon represents only 27% of that molecular weight, so they're going to need to collect 1,483.3 kilograms of carbon dioxide daily. Call it a ton and a half. From an atmosphere only 0.6% as dense as Earth. So what volume of the atmosphere would they need to process every day to harvest that total? There was an article we came across in Clean Technica that helps to understand what collecting a ton of carbon dioxide takes and the volume of air that needs to be moved. It was published as a critique response to the company we just mentioned, New Light Industries, the Dell bag makers. As it turns out, on Earth, to capture a ton of carbon dioxide, you need to filter a volume of air that would fill 1.1 Houston Astrodomes, an interesting metric to be sure. The Houston Astrodome, built in 1965 for a cost of $35 million, stands 18 stories above the playing field, 
and with a diameter of 710 feet or 220 meters, covers 9.5 acres or 3.8 hectares of land, giving it a volume of 42 million cubic feet or 1.2 million cubic meters. The one-ton metric adds another 10% to those numbers, taking them to 46.2 million cubic feet or 1.32 million cubic meters. That's on Earth. But we know that carbon dioxide is 15 times more abundant on Mars, so we divide by 15. So we would have to filter 3,080,000 cubic feet or 88,000 cubic meters for one ton. But we need almost a ton and a half per day, so back up to 4.62 million cubic feet or 132,000 cubic meters. 132,000 cubic meters in a column one meter wide and one meter high would stretch for 132 kilometers. At half a meter wide by half a meter tall, the cross section is one quarter the size, so that pipe would stretch out for 528 kilometers. For a circular pipe measuring 30 centimeters or about one foot across, the pipe would need to be 1,870 kilometers long meaning a fan would have to be blowing Martian atmosphere through this pipe at 78 kilometers per hour around the clock, or 156 kilometers an hour during a 12-hour duty cycle. Fans are typically measured in cubic feet per minute or cubic meters per hour. For example, a quick search on Amazon found this 2,295 cubic feet per minute, 3,900 cubic meters per hour blower fan, which has a round throat of 12 inches or 30 centimeters. It consumes 520 watts of power per hour. It would need to move 132,000 cubic meters every 12 hours, which it obviously cannot do by itself, but three of them could. So just to suck the Martian atmosphere into the capture apparatus, whatever that may look like, would require 1,560 watts per hour, or 18.7 kilowatt hours of energy daily. That is assuming that these fans are capable of grabbing Martian atmosphere in the first place. We're talking only 6 millibars of pressure instead of 1,013 millibars, and experiments we found online, it would seem that fans and near vacuums don't work well together, which is why Ingenuity was such a marvel. Ingenuity is the little helicopter drone that NASA set up with Perseverance, the first machine to fly on Mars. The dual rotors on Ingenuity are set up to rotate opposite each other like a next-gen military chopper, but because of the thin atmosphere, the 4-pound, 2-kilogram helicopter rotors have to hit speeds upwards of 2,500 RPM, about five times faster than a similar device on Earth. Since that's the case, maybe extraction fans aren't going to do the trick, and they'll have to move to something a little more high-tech. Most people have heard of the MOXIE device, also delivered by NASA's Perseverance rover, delivered to Mars by ULA in the February of 2021. MOXIE is the acronym for the Mobile Oxygen In-Situ Resource Utilization Experiment. The 17.1 kilogram device cost about $50 million to build as a cooperative effort between NASA and MIT. MOXIE is a relatively small gold box, measuring 24 by 24 by 31 centimeters, 9.5 by 9.5 by 12 inches. The device produces oxygen by heating small amounts of atmospheric carbon dioxide to 800 degrees Celsius, which splits an oxygen atom from the CO2 molecule producing carbon monoxide and oxygen. This experiment requires a dedicated constant 300 watt power source to power a process that would, at peak output, take over four days to create a single kilogram of oxygen gas. The Martian atmosphere is collected from MOXIE using a device called a scroll compressor. The one they're using on MOXIE was developed by a company called Air Squared. The scroll head resembles a balanced version of a snail shell cross section. As it spins, the open end of the coil grabs the Martian atmosphere and forces the very thin gas to the center of the vortex, thus increasing the pressure of the gas 100 fold when it is collected at the center. According to their published paper on smats.eu, this scroll compresses the gas from 4 torr to at least 760 torr by spinning at 2,000 to 4,000 RPM. But of course, the gas they're collecting is not straight carbon dioxide. Whatever gases the colonists collect are going to have to be separated into their pure forms so as not to contaminate the reaction chamber. This is the level of technology required to capture the Martian atmosphere on this small scale. Simple impellers or fans weren't up to the task. Now, not to take anything away from the amazing accomplishment and success of this experiment, but some people are under some misguided beliefs when it comes to MOXIE. One of the first is believing that because this process is capable of creating oxygen from the atmosphere, that this will somehow produce breathable air for future Martian colonists. They forget that our breathing mixture is only 21% oxygen, with nitrogen making up the other 78% of the mix, and nitrogen is scarce in the thin Martian atmosphere, sitting at only 1.9% of the 6 millibar atmosphere. 
The second misconception is that this particular process can be scaled up to accommodate propellant production, but MOXI only splits one oxygen atom from the carbon dioxide molecule and emits oxygen and carbon monoxide, not pure carbon atoms. So no matter what, the reaction presently running inside MOXI is unsuitable for the purpose of in-situ propellant production. This is probably a good place for a break to get up and stretch, refill your snacks and drinks, but part two is coming up as soon as you hit this button right here.